Hello. Are you all suitably drunk? Good. Um, this is some corporate information. OK. Um, greetings. 10 points if you can name all the languages, including Chav at the bottom. So yes, that is Klingon. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm Graham Sutherland. I'm a penetration tester at Port Collis. Um, my sort of general specialities are binary applications, cryptography, reverse engineering, hardware, and anything kind of weird. Um, often we get like the whole, we don't know what to do with this. Give it to Graham. Uh, yeah, I, I go by Polynomial on Stack Exchange and a few other places. Um, if you follow me on Twitter, you might recognize me by my party hat, which I'm not wearing much to Tim's annoyance. And yes, I am wearing both of my shoes. If you don't get that reference, um, I got very, very drunk at one of the previous security conferences and lost one of my shoes in the hotel. Um, it was slightly embarrassing. Um, so why am I doing this talk? Oh, I, and I apologize for the ridiculously bad t uh, puns in the titles. That's, yeah, it's horrendous. Um, so there's kind of a weird stigma against ring zero code, like driver code, kernel stuff. Um, people are scared of it. And I don't really know why, because it's not that hard. Like, I, I, all right, I'm, I'm lying. I know why, because the documentation's horrible most of the time. But um, it's not really that hard. Like, if you can write stuff in C, like, if you can write stuff in any programming language, really, that has, like, a main function, then you can write driver code, really. It's not that hard. Um, and you're going to learn, but not in seven days, hence the silly picture. Um, Again, bad pun in the title. Um, so we're going to look at some basic concepts, um, writing uh, kernel stuff. So it's the same basic stuff that you would find in user mode apps. Um, the additional bits are talking between user mode and kernel mode, because obviously they don't sit in the same kind of circles as each other. Um, you need special interactions to talk between each other. Um, we're going to talk about some additional Bits like major functions, IRPs, IOCTLs, we'll get to that later. And other special concepts like IRQLs. Uh, so if you're familiar with IRQL not less or equal, which I suspect that every single one of you in here has seen, seen that blue screen, um, you might find out why that exists. Um, m most stuff is officially documented. Some things are what, they call, uh, what Microsoft called opaque structures. Opaque structures means we don't want you to know about this field. Um, otherwise known as everybody else is going to reverse engineer that field and tell you exactly what it does, because it might be fun. Um, so yeah, there's some reverse engineered stuff as well. Um, the problem with kernel mode stuff, at least Windows stuff, um, there's a lot of abbreviations. It gets kind of messy, and you get very confused, because there's legacy abbreviations, which they don't use anymore. And then they change them to something else. And you're like, is that that is that that other thing? So I don't know. Hence why I'm hand well, hence why Dom, wherever he is, has handed out some of them, my, my vastly optimistic 20 sheets of paper. Um, test signing, sorry, uh, setting up the initial environment can be a pain in the ass. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, it's got better. Like WDK 10, um, again, abbreviation already. Uh, Windows Development Kit, Driver Kit, I can't remember what it's called. Um, 10, uh, which is the new one with Windows 10, as you might imagine. Um, integrates everything with Visual Studio. Um, but yeah, so it can be a pain in the ass to set up. Uh, test signing can be annoying um, because you're technically meant to sign your driver every time you create a test build, which can be obviously really, really annoying, but you can actually turn that off. Um, WinDebug has a learning curve. Um, it's not like Ollie, where you've got a screen and some disassembly and some memory, and you can just go, hey, I'm going at it. But yeah, you have to have, like, learn commands and stuff. It's like Vi which you may hate all of. Um, yeah, debugging can be clunky sometimes. Um, sometimes you can ha like have a VM, and then you reboot the VM, and then when debug doesn't attach to it, and you're like, ah, oh, now I have to reboot it again to make it attach. It's really stupid. Um, but yeah, a lot of this got better. And I was doing some testing stuff uh, the other day uh, on one of the new WDKs, which I hadn't played with before, and it's actually quite, quite a lot better than I remember it being. Um, so general setup of what you might imagine as your sort of testing rig for building drivers. Um, so you have a host operating system with WinDBG, um, the Windows SDK, and the driver kit, and Visual Studio on it. Um, I think in older WDKs, Visual Studio was optional, because you could actually compile everything from the 
command line, but I can't remember. Um, so then you've obviously got the host file system where you build your drivers to, which is then shared into the guest file system. So it's like some part of that file system, you'll have a shared folder or whatever. So you can quickly and easily copy drivers over and install them in the, in the guest OS. Um, then you've obviously got your driver running alongside the kernel in kernel space on the guest OS. And then you'll use something like a virtual serial port uh, so that WinDBG can do kernel debugging. Um, so there's a kind of block diagram. Apologies for the really horrendous color scheme. Um, so the sort of required tools, uh, a virtual machine that supports virtual serial ports or something along those lines. Um, clipboard and directory sharing is immensely useful because you'll get so annoyed at having every time you fix a bug or whatever, you gotta reboot the machine and copy the files over and ah, you'll kill yourself. But hopefully not. Um, VirtualBox and VMware both work. Um, you want the Windows driver kit or the development kit or whatever they call it these days, the BK. Yeah. Um, debugging tools for Windows, WinDBG essentially. Um, Visual Studio. CISA internal suite, so um, I'm imagining that probably any of you that have used Windows in a sort of power user sense will have possibly come across this internal, so things like Process Explorer, um, WinObj, uh, Procmon and that kind of thing. Uh, auto runs as well. So they're all written by uh, Mark Rasinovich, who's one of the Windows kernel guys. Um, and Notepad++ or something similar is useful just because text editors, yay. Um, so I'm very, very quickly going to go over what you would do to set up an environment. So you set up a VM, you install the OS, drop your VM tools package in there, install the sysinternal suite on there because you probably want that. Um, configure it to use uh, either full or at least full kernel uh, crash dumps. In fact, I would probably say that full memory dumps are kind of stupid. I don't think you really need them in this case. So kernel mem full, full kernel memory dumps, not just like the standard crash dumps because you get a lot more information in there if you're going to be doing debugging. Um, set up a shared folder to drop your new drivers in. Uh, virtual serial port, uh, maximum board rate possible so that you can do the debugging um, tied to a, um, a named pipe on the, on the host side. So the idea of that is that um, WinDBG can uh, tie onto a, uh, a named pipe which then goes into a serial port in a virtual machine. So the idea is that you can essentially run WinDBG and do debugging on a VM relatively easy on one system without actually physically having to have a serial uh, port because like what motherboard has those anymore. Um, turn off driver uh, signature enforcement. Now, sometimes you don't have to do this. So I think on some OSs you don't have to turn that on because once you enable kernel debugging, it just says, you know what, no, I don't need that. Uh, and then BCD edit to uh, enable kernel debugging. Um, so as you might imagine, it lets you debug the kernel. Uh, yeah, configure your host machine, so drop the SDK, WDK, Visual Studio, blah, 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 blah. Um, you wanna set up WinDBG to use the Microsoft symbol servers. What that does is, um, Normally, WinDBG will only be able to see the, the raw assembly or whatever of uh, the kernel or all of the Windows, standard Windows drivers. If you set up the symbol server, what that'll do is it'll let you see things like, um, it's like reference source. It'll at least tell you function names and things like that. Um, so it, it gives you a lot more information when you're debugging. It essentially just downloads them off the net and stores them in a local cache. Um, set up Visual Studio for building drivers. As I said, in the new WDK, it's kind of easier because things sort of come integrated. I haven't played with it enough to comment on it massively. Um, and if needed, set up the tools for test signing, but hopefully you won't need to because test signing is a pain in the ass if you have to do it every single bloody time you change your driver. <laughs> then check everything works, blah, 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 blah. Use WinDBG, learn how to do that um, as well. Uh, but yeah, DB, uh, debug view is another one of these sysinternals tools. Um, Enable all the captures, and essentially it, think of it like a debug string output for your drivers. Ah, I have a fly landing on me. Ugh, sorry about that. Um, so, as I said, there's lots of weird acronyms. Unfortunately, um, I don't know what half of those actually mean. Um, but yeah, you need to kind of pick a driver type to start with. Um, and when I first tried to get into messing with drivers, I was like, oh God, what the hell is all of this? Like, the, the problem is there's like legacy documentation and then people are writing tutorials on one type that is no longer even supported on newer operating systems. It's like, ah, so screw it. What a calling. Yeah, um, yeah, so screw it, just like go with it. Um, that's a driver. Why are you scared? Um, all it does is debug print, I love alpacas, because I do love alpacas. Um, so yeah, that's a driver. 
stop being scared of drivers because that's essentially like a main function. It prints a string and then returns. And that will probably compile. Um, ah, no. God damn it, LibreOffice. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> Sorry. So, then we compile all the things. Um, so, you can compile it and link it with the tool chain from the WDK, but obviously, if you've got the new version, it's integrated with Visual Studio and blah, blah, blah. Or you can use MS Build from the command line, which means that if you like command line things, you can do it from that. It produces a .sys. I can't remember whether it produces the .inf. I couldn't look it up in time for making this presentation, but um, the .inf is like a. Um, uh, it's like metadata for your driver. Um, it also produces debug symbols, which are very useful. So you drop them into a directory, and then you point WinDBG at that, and when you're debugging your driver, it will show you the source code, so you can actually step through it. It's quite nice. Um, and then you install uh, the driver using SC, so which is the service manager thingy. Um, so you essentially say, create a service, called my driver, give it a bin path of like wherever your driver is and tell it it's a kernel device and then ta-da, it's installed. And then you just do sc start and then the driver name. Um, I quite like this modified version. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so now what? Because like you, you wrote a driver but it's, it's, it's useless. Sorry. <laughs> um, do something useful. Uh, so you want to create a driver that does something useful. So in this case, what we're actually talking about is um, what's technically called software drivers. So these are drivers that do things in the kernel that you can't do in user, user space. Um, that you don't, that, that they don't handle hardware. So you can have a, a device driver, a hardware driver that's you know oh, I handle a USB device or I handle this weird PCI card or blah 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 blah. Or you can just create something that's essentially just software that runs in the kernel. Um, so in this case, we're only going to talk about that, uh, about the software side, because the hardware side, eh, it's too much to talk about in this time. Um, so yeah, so you create a driver handle uh, with IO create device. Um, you can communicate with the driver using these various things, um, and then there's some synchronization involved because you don't obviously don't want to say, oh yeah, I'm going to read this memory at the same time as this, the thing is going to write this memory, and then oh no, everything's broken. Um, so this is what it looks like if you uh, want to create a device. Um, I don't have a laser pointer or anything, so I'm just going to sort of hope that you can read the line numbers maybe. Can you? Sort of? Yes, okay. Um, so, all you're really doing here is, so again, this is the driver entry, which is uh, like main in a C application. Um, so you get a driver object and the registry path. I'm not sure what the registry path is. Mm. Um, and what you're doing is you're calling IO create device on the driver object and saying, um, I want to create a driver with a, 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 sorry, a device with a particular name. Now, what a device is, is it's. Um, so Windows has this concept of the object manager, and the object manager is everything that is an object is managed um, in a particular way and in, in a hierarchy, and you can use a tool called WinObj to go and look at all of these objects. So you can have things like devices, or you can have things like um, sessions, or uh, mutexes, or semaphores, events, shared memory sections, and, these, uh, uh, and named pipes. So these named objects sit in the object manager, um, and in this particular case, what we're doing is we're taking, we're calling IO create device to create one of these devices. Um, SZ driver name is defined somewhere else, which is just a string of the name of the, 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 the device. And what that's doing is it's creating an object that user space can see. So in kernel space, you're creating an ob a, a sort of a, a reference to your driver that user space can then open a handle to and start sending things at. Um, then there are some other options which I'm just going to gloss over because eh. Um, then you essentially say, if this was a, a success, in this case, actually, I, I don't return anything but state as a success, which is probably a bad idea. But um, in this case, you say, OK, I'm no longer in, uh, initializing. So you, you basically flip the initializing bit off on your status flags 
um, you say, oh, I would like to also be able to do buffered I.O., which is just a nice thing to switch on. I'll explain buffered I.O. a little bit later. Um, then you set a device extension. Now, device extensions are useful for various reasons. Um, you don't need to really worry about that too much at the moment. Uh, it kind of goes outside the scope of this talk, but it's kind of nice to set one there. Um, so then you create what's called major function handlers. Now, the obvious first one here is unload. So what do I want to do when the driver is unloaded? So do I, do I you know, maybe, maybe I've allocated some, fly, sorry. Um, maybe I've allocated some memory and I want to clear it out. Uh, maybe, you know, I've got handles to some other bits and bobs around the system and I want to get rid of those. Um, so that's your driver unload function. So you essentially say, uh, the driver objects, uh, driver unload callback is driver unload, which is some other function somewhere in the, this driver. And then you get what's called the major functions. Now the major functions are essentially, um, they're function pointers that go off to various handlers, which we call dispatch functions. Um, so for example, um, when you call uh, create, what's called create file, it's an API in Windows uh, in the user mode, uh, create file, ironically, opens files. Um, it also creates them, but it opens them as well. Um, and that's what, what that's saying is it's creating a, some sort of context within the driver. So I, I want to, from user mode, I want to connect to the, the driver and create will be called. And then I want to close this handle. The close callback will be called. I want to read some data from the driver. The read callback will be called. Write, blah, 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 blah. And I'll explain some of these other. The only two at the bottom there, power and PNP. Power events and plug and play events. But kind of outside of the scope of this talk. So yeah, so the disp the, these are what uh, the, uh, the major functions get past what's called dispatch handlers. So they're used to perform actions when certain I.O. calls are performed on the device objects or when certain events call. So the standard I.O., you, got, you might recognize create file, close file, read file, write file as Windows user mode APIs. Um, and the idea is that you call create file on a driver object by its name, uh, sorry, device object on its, by its name. Um, you get a handle to that device object, and then you can do things with it. And then when you're done, you close it. So that create file call will call that dispatch create function. The close file will call dispatch closed. Read file, write file, dispatch read, dispatch write. And this is where that IRP, MJ, that indexes into an array of function pointers. Now, because that's quite restrictive as a model, what they also have is custom I.O. via the user mode device I.O. control uh, API. And the idea is that device I.O. control will pass some sort of I.O. control code, and then that will get dispatched from dispatch device control. But we'll explain that a little bit more later. And then events power events, plug and play. So power events, all oh, the system's about to shut off or go to sleep or it's just woke up or whatever. Um, so when, he, when any of these dispatch functions are called, which is the device is told that a user mode function has been called against it, um, it gets issued what's called an IO request packet or an IRP. Now an IRP is a little bit, it's essentially just a structure in memory. Um, and the IRP contains the major function number, so that index in that table that it wants to call, um, some optional data depending on the individual type of call, uh, the, uh, it, the individual major function that's being called, and some information about input-output buffers, so like the length of the buffer, a pointer to the buffer in user space. Um, and then the driver, what's called dispatches, i.e. it goes, oh, um, which major function was just called? Oh, go to that handler. So it, dispatches the IRP to an appropriate handler using the dispatch table, which is called major functions, which if I go back again, as you can see, it's saying the major function that is here, call this particular handler the dispatch function. Okay, so if you wanna handle one of these IRPs, these IO request packets, you get this, what's called the stack location of the IRP, which is the location of it on the IRP stack, um, which is just a pointer, basically. Um, you access the IRP parameters uh, via a IO stack location structure or a pointer to it, hence the PIO. Um, then 
you look at the parameters of that IRP. Now, the parameters are a union, uh, a union structure. Um, so essentially, the idea is that um, all of these, uh, that it has a bunch of properties in there, like create, read, write, close, device IO control, whatever. And they contain parameters, or rather, th th they contain some sort of structural representation of the parameters. And you pick the right one, depending on what kind of uh, uh, IRP you've been sent. And then you use complete request API, uh, it's a kernel API, to uh, complete the IRP, which is essentially saying that this driver in the stack of drivers that exist has now processed this IRP, and you can stop worrying about it. Um, don't worry if this is a little bit confusing. It gets a little bit easier later on. Um, so buffered IO is used for the read and write functions. So if I just go back quickly, so you see the, the read and write there, and you can see again, read and write, the dispatch functions are there. So this is when like uh, read file, write file are called on the handle of the driver. Buffered IO is essentially a way of saying, I want to get some data from you, or I want to give you some data. Um, so they're not, sh the, buffers that are pr the buffers in memory are not shared between user space and kernel space. So it's not like you create one buffer and just go, oh, um, yeah, everybody can just play around with that. Um, what happens is they exchange the buffer. So they go, I mean, this is a, a, a kernel mode buffer, and then it finishes, and then it goes, right, now this has been moved into user space, or this is a user space buffer, and now I'm gonna transition this over to the kernel, and the kernel can read it. And that way you don't have this weird, like, can the user mode like, change data while the kernel mode is doing, so, uh, the kernel driver is doing something? You don't want that to happen. The obvious use case here is um, data transfer on things like hardware device drivers. So for example, you've got a network interface and it's got a new packet and you then call read file on the, uh, the kernel driver for the, the network interface and then that gives you the packet that just arrived or the same for like a disk, you can read and write data to that disk. It's a little bit more complicated than that but it's just an example. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, as I say, it's, it's a relatively trivial concept, but I'm not going to show the code because there's actually a fair amount of code to show you like a working example, and I can't really fit it on the screen because our slides are weird. So um, custom control codes. So I mentioned all the stuff like create, close, read, write, and power events. Um, but device control is a slightly different one. So. Anybody who's familiar with sort of like user mode and kernel mode um, stuff in Linux uh, possibly knows about IOCTLs. Um, it's, exactly, it's almost exactly the same thing in Windows. Um, so IOCTLs allow for what's called, well, what's essentially custom functionality in a driver. So think of it like the driver exposing some kind of API so that the user mode can say, oh, driver, go do this. Um, so just like any other IRP, it's when the user mode says, oh, driver, I'd like you to do something, it gets past an IRP, it handles that, but inside the parameters of that IRP, it has what's called an IOCTL, an IO control code. And the IO control code is just a number. So it's a num it's a, I think it's a 32-bit number. I'm not sure whether it's 64-bit on 64-bit. I think it's still 32-bit, but eh. Um, who needs more than 32 bits? Um, so you, you trigger it via a device I.O. control call. Um, device I.O. control is a, is a uh, user mode API in Windows. Um, and essentially, you just say, device I.O. control, uh, pass it a handle to the driver, pass it the number that you want to pass it, and then give it some information about the input and output buffers that you want to hand in. So like you might, you might have, for example, in a, an antivirus uh, driver, you might say, OK, um, I have a device I.O. control so I have an IOCTL for um, scan this particular file. And then in the user mode, you say device IO control, handle to the, uh, the kernel driver. Um, this is the IOCTL for uh, scan this file. Um, then you say, OK, this is the length of the buffer that I'm going to hand you. And inside the buffer, you can put like the, the full path to the file that you want to scan. And then the output, um, you can say, OK, my output buffer is one byte, and set this to one if you detected something, and zero if you didn't detect something. So that's kind of the, the, the sort of example use case of that. Um, it's always fun to reverse engineer drivers and then look for the uh, custom IOCTLs, because you will find all sorts of when. Um, oh, I, I should have pointed out at the very start of this, this is not really a security talk. 
it's, it's more of a um, play with kernel things, they're fun. Um, but you may find a lot of security impacts. And if I get time at the end of this, which I don't know whether or I don't know how far I throw I am, um, I will, th there is a slide on how to play with these things in terms of security. But um, example, the IOCTL dispatch. So the major function for IO control, uh, device IO control, um, the, the dispatch table will point it to the dis this dispatch control function. The dispatch control function then goes, okay, I just got an IRP for uh, an IO control. Um, which IO control was I given? Which, which IO CTL was I given? So in this case, we've defined a single IO CTL, which is NOR X LEET1234. Um, and we say, okay, if we get that one, now we're gonna dispatch the something, whatever that is. Um, so it, it's like a way of extending the major function uh, uh, table. Uh, and then obviously if nothing happens, you return a status invalid device request because we say, well, well I don't know what that IO CTL is, go away. Um, and the bits here at the start are, you get the IRP location so that you can get its param uh, the IRP stack location so you can get the, uh, the parameters for it. You look at the uh, device IO control uh, field of the parameter structure to say, okay, well, how big's the input buffer, how big's the output buffer. I think there's a couple of others in there that tell you the, the, the buffer um, pointers so you can read and write from them, but I didn't include it in this because we don't need it. Um, and then we say, uh, yeah, uh, the, Oh yes, the, the, the IO control code that was passed to us, so the IO CTL that was passed, and then we switch based on that, and then we say, okay, is it this one? Okay, let's dispatch it to that. So that's why it's called a, an IO CTL dis dispatch. So this is um, the user mode code that would trigger that. So you use create file to open a handle to the device. So my device would be the name of the, the, the kernel driver that we're trying to talk to. Um, we open it with various parameters. It's not really important. We, you can look up examples of this online. Um, if the handle is invalid, then you couldn't open the device for whatever reason and die. Um, otherwise, uh, try and send the device IO control. Uh, so what we're saying is device IO control with the parameters of handles of the device, the IO CTL we want to send. Now I've just filled those with null, but essentially the first one is I think the input buffer pointer, then the size of the input buffer, output buffer pointer, size of the output buffer, and then there's some additional parameters on the end, which for this, you don't really need to worry about. Um, and then the result of that being, you know, you can say, oh, did it work, did it not work? You get a status back from the driver. Now, so I'll just go back home quickly. Now, the problem is, in this particular scenario, all, all that's really happening is the user mode is telling the driver to do something. So it's going, hi driver, go do something. But what if the driver wants to say, you know what, no, I, I've just done something, I want user mode to know about it. I want user mode to do something. Or I want it to know that I finished doing, uh, finished playing with a particular memory buffer or whatever. So you use synchronization objects. Now synchronization objects are Something that anybody who's done anything to do with like multi-threaded programming should know something about. Um, so they're about synchronizing signaling between user mode and kernel mode, also between user mode and user mode, and also between kernel mode and kernel mode, really. Um, but it's about like, think of it like locks and things like that. Like, I, oh, um, I have access to this object, therefore you can't have access to this object. Um, when I'm done with it, then you can. Um, mute access semaphores, events, those kinds of things, events, really useful because you can say, the kernel mode, uh, the kernel can say, oh, fire off this event, and then the user mode, uh, some user mode application might be waiting on that event, and when that happens, something can occur on user mode, and that way you've got communication between, uh, from kernel mode to user mode, and user mode to kernel mode. Uh, when, you, when they're named, so you can have non-named ones, which you have to have a handle to to do anything with, or you can have named ones, which means you can create a handle just by knowing what the name of it is. So when they're named, um, they're accessible to both kernel and user land. Um, you can get them in the, for example, the, the global namespace, but there are other namespaces as well. And WinObj can list them from user space. So if you've got the sys internal suite installed, fire up WinObj, and you can see all the objects, so like semaphores, mutexes, events, whatever. Um, Security-wise, Check your discretionary access control list, so the, the, the ACLs. Um, 
So if you look at these objects, uh, right-click properties and then look at the security tab, um, if they've got no D DACL attached, fun thing about the Windows Object Manager is that its default is everybody can access me and do anything they like. So if you don't actually explicitly set a DACL, um, anybody can mess with your object, which is probably bad, which I may have lots of ODA based on. Um, so yeah, so check that you're set, set, check that drivers are setting the DACLs correctly, because if they're not, if they're not explicitly saying, okay, only administrators can access this device, then anybody can access it in any particular way that they like, and they can often find all sorts of fun things. So a while back, I um, <clears throat> there was a uh, a bug in uh, Sophos, was it, so no, it was Symantec, wasn't it? Was it Sophos? No, it's Symantec, it was Endpoint. Symantec Endpoint. Um, Symantec Endpoint protection had a bug where one of the mutexes that were, well, a, a whole bunch of mutexes that were um, related to locking particular buffers for communication between use mode and uh, kernel mode in one of the, in their uh, on access, uh, sorry, on demand access uh, scanning drive, uh, driver. Um, the mutexes weren't, pro uh, weren't protected at all. Um, and if you locked them all, every single bit of disk I.O. stopped working. It locked up, um, which meant that paged memory couldn't be fetched from disk, which meant that the entire operating system locked up, and in some cases, hard locked. So you had to physically reset the box, which was lots of fun. So yeah, um, so that's now fixed. Um, oh, speaking of shared memory. Um, so shared memory, in Windows, it works quite similar to how Linux works. Um, so you create a segment of memory that's shared between processors. You have a handle to it, or a name of it, um, from which you can get a, uh, a handle. And the idea is that if you can share it between user mode and kernel code, um, you can share data through that shared memory section. Um, as I say, it can be named just like other objects. Um, and it has similar uh, memory flags to like normal allocation. So you can say, oh, it's readable, it's writable, it's executable, although I'm not sure why you'd want to execute a shared memory section. That sounds really dodgy, don't do that. Um, but yeah, it's usable for passing data, but um, you need to synchronize, because if you don't synchronize, you might find that you're reading it while somebody else is writing to it, and then your program crashes, and you're sat there going, why is this happening? And um, memory access as well. So in drivers, Memory access is a bit weird. So you have a concept of, I don't know why I've called it unpaged, because that's just not even right. It's called non-paged. Um, so paged memory is stuff that can be swapped out to disk, or put anywhere it likes, really. Um, whereas non-paged has to be in the system memory. It has to be right there, and the processor has to be able to access it. Now, Page memory, as I say, might not be in the system memory, so you have to watch out for this. And I, I will explain this slightly later, but um, IRQL as an interrupt mas uh, masking can break all of your things if you do it wrong, um, and I will explain that in a moment. So in order to actually explain IRQLs and that kind of thing, I need to explain what interrupts are. So traditionally, um, interrupts are hardware signals they're sort of sometimes software signals, um, but usually hardware signals. Um, that if you think about it in terms of like wires, which is essentially what your motherboard is made out of, chips and wires, um, you set a particular wire, a particular line to have a high voltage or a low voltage, depending on what it is, um, and that says, oh, an interrupt has just occurred, and then part of your hardware will recognize that and then trigger a particular handler what's called a service routine. Um, so it's usually to signal an event, like, for example, a network card might go, oh, I have a new packet for you to do something with. Um, boop, go and do something with that, please. Here, here is your service handler that needs to be called, blah, blah, blah. Um, in hardware, this is driven by something called the APIC, the Advanced Programmable Interrupt Controller. Ye olde hardware, like things that use ISA buses, um, used, I think it might have even been before that, used just the PIC, which wasn't advanced, for whatever reason that is. Um, but yeah, so essentially, it's a way of offloading uh, interrupts onto something that isn't directly the processor, so you have this, this APIC, but don't worry about that. So we have this concept of um, interrupt request levels. Now, 
Imagine, for example, you've got a bit of uh, code that you want to run. But that code is in paged memory, like everything in user mode. Everything in user space is paged. So um, you haven't used it for a while, so you've swapped it out to disk. So that piece of code is actually sat on disk. It's not in your, it's not in your system memory. So the processor got, has not no way of reading it at the moment. So it says, hey, disk, read me this sector and then put it in memory. Or rather, it will go into memory. So that happens, and now it's in memory, and now it can be executed. Now, while the processor is waiting for that to happen, um, the problem is, if you get something that interrupts in between, so it interrupts that request. So you've got, you're waiting for this interrupt for, from the hard disk to come back and say, oh, give me this data. What if other things are getting in the way? What if other device requests are getting in the way? Or what if it's even simpler? What if you're saying to your memory chips, your actual system memory, hi, I'd like this bit of memory. I'd like, the, I'd like this bit of data out of your memory. And then somebody moves the mouse. And then an interrupt comes in and says, oh, the mouse moved. Now, should a mouse move event really get in the way of like, I'm reading the memory. Like, I'm reading the kernel code. And you move your poxy mouse. I don't give a shit about your mouse. Shut up. Go away. So this is why we have this thing called um, interrupt masking. So interrupt masking is essentially, don't tell me about anything that's happening below this level or above this level, depending on which way you look at it. Um, so like, I don't want to know about the mouse moving if I'm in the middle of trying to service, I don't know, like a power event or I'm, tr I'm trying to service a memory fetch, something really important. I don't care about the less important things. I don't care about my network card having a new packet ready if I'm in the middle of trying to handle something super critical to the running of the operating system. Um, so dispatch is what's considered the normal level. So the, 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 it's, it's the, um, the dispatch level is anything can happen. Anything can, I can be told about anything whatsoever. Now, when I'm in the middle of being told about some super critical PCIe device doing something important or, you know, like the APIC has come up and said, oh, this, the, the chipset wants to talk to you. It's like, shut up, mouse, chipset's talking to me. Um, shut up, network card, chipset's talking to me. Um, so this is the whole kind of, the, the, the masking part of it. So the IRQL, the interrupt request level, is essentially at what point am I in this sort of masking level? Do, do, do I want this thing to bother me? Do I want this thing to bother me? Um, now, accessing memory, paged memory, at an IRQL larger than dispatch, will give you an instant blue screen of death. Because the problem is, if you're not at dispatch, something else is talking to you, and you can't guarantee that while the interrupts are currently masked, you can talk to the hard disk. Because if you can't talk to the hard disk, and the memory's paged out to the hard disk, you can't get the memory. And if the memory is important, like the next bit of code you need to execute, you're going to crash. Um, or if the memory is important, like the next bit of data you need to read so you can finish executing what you're doing now, you're screwed. So, it's going to crash. So that's why you get this IRQL not less or equal. I don't know why they just call it IRQL more. It made more sense, but IRQL not less or equal. So you're saying the, the interrupt request level is not, lower, uh, is not uh, lower than or equal to what my current IRQL is. But that is something, something more important is happening than what you're able to read from, uh, sorry, from what you're asking me to do. Um, so reasons that you might get these RQL not less or equal, which is now renamed, I believe, to memory management in newer versions of Windows, which is super vague. Um, so reasons for IRQL BSODs, um, you accessed invalid memory. This is the number one. It's got, uh, most of the time when you get these, it's got nothing to do with the IRQL reading wrong. It's that you tried to read the wrong bit of memory and that memory turned out to be paged and ah, everything died. So you were in a bit of memory that should only read non-paged memory, and it tried to read paged memory. So for example, a null point to dereference, um, or you read past the end of a buffer, or whatever, um, which incidentally is where you get all the happy fun times of buffer overflows and null point to derefs and all those kinds of things. Um, or you're genuinely the wrong IRQL. So you might be in an interrupt service routine, an ISR. So you might be like servicing an interrupt from a piece of hardware that's just said, I have memory for, uh, I have a new thing for you to do. And then you go, oh, yeah, great. Now I'm going to read page memory and try to talk to the disk. And it's going to go and die. 
uh, or wizard magic, otherwise known as um, I don't know why this crashed. Sometimes you just get these for no reason. Yeah. Or it used to be the case more in Windows XP. So if your driver does crash, you get a BSOD, which is officially known as a bug check. You get a crash dump, a .dmp file, which you load into WinDBG. You make sure your symbol path is set, uh, properly set. Now, before I was talking about compiling drivers. Um, if you compile a driver, then you have the symbols for the driver, which means you know what the source, uh, where the source is for the driver, which means when you're doing uh, debugging, if you set the symbol path correctly, you can see the source of your driver and step through it in real time, just like you were debugging it in real life. Um, and then that's a lot nicer than looking at horrible, scary assembly, if you don't know assembly. Um, so the dot reload function in WinDBG um, is really useful, because um, essentially, if you forget to set your symbols, or you set them into the wrong place, or you just need to change them, type dot reload, and it reloads your full set of symbols, um, which is nice. And exclamation mark analyze V, or bang. I don't know why people call it bang, it's weird. Um, but yeah, analyze minus V. Um, and what that does is, that's a crash dump analysis. Um, so if ever you get a BSOD, load the dump into WinDBG, do an analyze V, and it will tell you which driver crashed, and it will tell you why, and it will show you things like the current CPU register state at the, at the crash, and uh, what the stack looked like, and you can look at things like the memory, and things like that. And from there, learn from your mistakes, because if, you, if you're if you writing a driver, you're gonna see lots of blue screens. Like, um, my university project was to write, well, I, I chose to write um, a driver uh, that essentially emulates what antivirus would do, um, in that it was using the, the driver to notify user mode when new processes and threads and all sorts of other things were happening. And I saw thousands of blue screens in that time because I was writing bad code. But you learn from your mistakes and you're like, oh, okay, so that's what happens when that, oh, okay, yeah. So they, learn from your mistakes when you see stuff and you, you start to learn more how to uh, do more in-depth debugging, various other things. Um, how long have I got left? I don't know. Officially? Oh, I don't know, officially, unofficially, I don't care. 12 officially 12, oh no, that's great. Okay, um, I have a fake end slide, ignore it, because um, I've got a few more slides that I added in just in case I had more time. Um, I seem to have plowed through this relatively quickly. Um, learning resources, um, MSDN, yay. Um, so that's the official documentation. Not always perfect, because as I say, some things are just not documented on purpose. They'll say, this is an opaque structure, which is the bane of my life. Um, otherwise known as, this is undocumented, you shouldn't rely on it. Otherwise known as, this is exactly the thing that I want to look at, because I want to break everything. Um, Windows internals books. So I think they're on the sixth edition now, which is split into part one and part two. Part one has all the security-related stuff in. So if you're only looking for the security-related stuff, don't buy part two, just buy part one. Um, um, part two has, uh, so what they do is they split um, all of the Windows subsystems, like the memory manager, um, the process for like creating new processes, um, the security sy subsystem, uh, the session subsystem. They split it into two books. Um, some of that stuff is in two, some of it is in one. The core stuff, like the boot um, and memory management and things like that, is all in one. The more sort of Higher level stuff is in two, but the security stuff is in one. So if you only if you only buy one, buy volume, uh, buy part one. Um, and again, it's written by Mark Rusinovich and a couple of other guys, but um, he's the guy who does all of the uh, system tunnels. Sweet. Uh, Bill Blunden's Rootkit's book. I can't remember the title of it, so I just wrote that. Um, I learned more about Windows drivers from that than I learned from anything else. He tells you about all sorts of crazy, slightly undocumented stuff. It's, it's aimed at Vista, but you can translate a lot of it across. Um, he shows you everything about like hooking Windows drivers, um, hooking all sorts of uh, call gates that occur, and it, it goes into an incredible amounts of detail, but you learn so much out of it. And, it's chock full of compilable, actual, proper source code to write real kernel mode rootkits. Um, but that in the process, you learn a lot about um, a lot about the, the Windows kernel. Um, OSR Online, um, they're more of a generic, um, like build your own operating system kind of resource. Um, but they have a lot in there about the Intel architecture, which is very useful. But they also provide a lot of references to Windows stuff. Um, Reactos, believe it or not, this is a open source Windows clone. Um, 
and it's extremely useful because essentially every single thing that they write is reverse engineered from the real version of Windows, and then it's fully commented, and you can just read all the source. So if you're not quite sure how a particular like function that you're looking at works, looking at the Reactos source is absolutely fantastic because you can essentially get a somebody else has done all the hard work for you. And uh, ntkernel.com has loads of nice little bits of reference. Now, here's my fake end of presentation slide, and here's my next slide. Um, so I thought that I would talk a little bit about the hardware side on this slide, at least. I don't know whether I, I can't remember what I put in the next one. Um, so when you get a hardware interrupt, you can't be slow. You can't say, oh, um, OK, you just interrupted me. Uh, you, you just sent me an interrupt. I'm going to handle your interrupt. So I'm going to compute all of the digits of pi up to a billion, because your system will crash, because it can't do anything, because it's blocks until you're, you return. So um, the other problem is that uh, your interrupt might occur as an IRQL that's prohibitive for doing certain things, like accessing page memory. Um, or you might want to interact with other bits of hardware that you can only talk to at higher IRQLs. Um, so the solution for this is something called a DPC, a deferred procedure call, which is essentially, you've interrupted me. However, I'm going to quickly say, yes, OK, that's fine. I will handle this. Then instead of blocking the ISR, uh, blocking the um, uh, interrupt uh, servicing thingy, I forgot what it's called now, uh, interrupt service routine, um, I'm going to do this in a bit. Um, I'm, I'm going to handle this later. Um, and essentially what DPC does is you can say, OK, have, a, have this callback function. Um, deal with this later. Let the ISR return. But I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I've got a copy of the data that I need. I'm going to handle it. Um, and then Windows will dispatch, it, dispatch this particular function back again at uh, a more sensible IRQL at a time when it's not like I have to complete all of my work in this tiny, tiny amount of memory, uh, this tiny, tiny amount of uh, time. Um, OK, next little bit, uh, pen test tips. Um, if you're pen testing a driver, these are the things to do. Open it in IDA or a similar tool. Um, look for the driver main. Look for major function point allocations. So you remember the, uh, the bit of code I showed with the array where they're setting uh, the dispatch functions for each of those major functions? Um, you want to look for that, so you can start investigating those. Look for the uh, I/O control uh, dispatcher, and then start looking at their custom I/O CTLs. Um, I found a lot of fun. Um, I will possibly be coming out with three or four bugs in the foreseeable future uh, relating to uh, motherboard vendors uh, having some terrible drivers that implement custom I/O CTLs that do some just ridiculously bad stuff, um, like le letting you map all of kernel memory to user memory, um, read-write from a guest user. It's just dumb. Um, then uh, you want to look for things like uh, create calls. So uh, create mutex, create semaphore, create event. Um, and then check the uh, access control list from user mode in WinObj. Um, the reason for that is, as I explained before, if they don't have a DA, if they don't explicitly set a DACL, the default is just null, which means the default is everybody can do anything they like to it. Which, if it's particularly sensitive, like for example, I'm writing arbitrary bits of memory into kernel space um, or untrusted data into kernel space, um, you don't want to be able to do that from like a, a, a low privileged account. Um, so having the DACL set can be important, and as I explained before, the, uh, the uh, Symantec endpoint bug. It was Symantec. What do we use on our laptops? Shit, it's so fast. Sorry, Symantec. <laughs> I was sure. It starts with an S. They're all the same. Um, it's AV. Who cares? Um, yeah, it's AV. You're all shit. Um, Sorry. Uh, the, yeah, it's, uh, you also want to look for the usual buffer overflow, integer casting bugs, blah, 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 the usual crap you'll find in C code. Um, fuzz everything. Uh, if you pwn the kernel, you pwn the box. Um, you bring, hello, 
Yes. So as, as Tim quite rightly points out, most of this is applicable no matter what operating system architecture you're looking at. Essentially, pwn the kernel, pwn the box is pretty much the, th or, or unless you're talking about some ridiculously obscure micro kernel design, pwn the kernel, you pwn the box. Um, and that's the real end. Um, any questions? <laughs>